Hello, this is Dan Alford with the ARC Specialties Roboticist Chronicles podcast. This is another in our series on Dan's business secrets. If you're going to be in a creative industry, you need to know a patent attorney. Fortunately, I've got a great one. His name is John Egbert. We've been working together for over 20 years. It's resulted in these four patents, a couple of trademarks. And we've got a bunch more that are still pending. In fact, John just finished one for me in the medical field uh, that will be granted soon. Everybody needs a patent attorney, and if you don't have one, what we're going to do for you today is let you hear what John has taught me over all these different years. He's compressed it all into one small podcast. I think you're going to get a lot out of this. Thanks for joining us. Hello, I'm Dan Alford with the ARC Specialties Roboticist Chronicles podcast. This is uh, one of our series on Dan's business secrets. I'm bringing in the people that taught me things. And today we have my patent lawyer. I've been working with John Egbert for many, many years. John, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, I appreciate it, Dan. Always good to see you again in my offices. Yeah, we're downtown Houston, uh, 12th floor. So this, this is uh, one of your offices. One thing I really enjoy about coming to your office is all the pictures you have on the wall. You seem to be uh, all about Houston history. Yeah, it, it just started off as a little hobby. I had a picture or two for a little office that I had. And then I grew and grew and grew some more. And then I got in touch with an archivist at the library who kept pictures like this. And he would say, he would call me and say, I've just found this fantastic photo of old Houston. Do you want a, a copy of it? And then my collection just grew and grew until I ran out of wall space. And now I'm at a holding pattern. I'm not looking for new, new photos anymore. I'm proud to say this one, I, I got you. And it was out of the Hughes Tool archives. And they made me promise that you're not going to make money off of this photo. <laughs> <laughs> I told them that you wouldn't. But that, that's from the, because uh, that's my first job when I came to Houston was Hughes Tool. And, and that's sort of iconic here in Houston. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Was it on Clinton Drive or? No, we, when I started, it was on Polk Street. OK, OK. Polk Street there. And that's now uh, gone, and they're up in the woodlands. But let's back up. Okay, well, I'm gonna sure. talk, we're talking about you. Okay, I don't even recall when we met. It's got to have been 20 years I'm ago. I'm thinking 30 years 30 ago. 30 years ago. I just dug up. Yeah, a, pull out those your, patents. <laughs> one of your old, I'm saying old patents, uh, year 2000. Okay. So at least 20 years, 22 perhaps years 25 years. All right, because it takes a couple of years to get the patent. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And that one was 98, so 25 years mm. of fun and games. Indeed. All right, so uh, you're the subject matter expert on yourself. So you're a, a, you're a recovering industrial engineer, is that right? Right, right, right. Industrial engineer. You don't know too much about anything, but you know a lot about a lot of little things. Was yeah. it your plan to go right into to patent law, or, or did you want to be an engineer? I kind of wanted to be an engineer because I could earn a living being an engineer. And then I went off to law school, and I wanted to be the greatest criminal attorney in the city. And then I realized I needed to earn a living. And then I fell into patent law. And I, I loved it. It's, a, it's an incredible profession, because every day is something new, something really interesting, things you haven't ever seen before. And you never know where it's going to take you along the way. And unlike a lot of fields of law, people are usually pretty happy to see me. <laughs> right. But I'm not, they're not going through a divorce. They haven't been arrested. They haven't been injured. So it's really a fun profession. OK, so you're from Indiana. Yes. But then you ended up here in Houston. Yes. What, what's that story? Uh, Is that oil field again? I was working a really bad job as an engineer in Indianapolis, Indiana. I needed to get away from the snow. Uh, I was caught in the blizzard of 1976, and then I got accepted to law school at the University of Houston. And at that time, the entire Midwest was flooding down to Houston for opportunity. And I was one of those snowbirds that came down here at the time. Because the oil field was booming right around then. Booming, 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 booming. Mm -hmm. Then I get out of law school, and it's bust, 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 bust. So right. uh, it was in very interesting. Yeah, I came a couple of years after you in uh, 79 and got, got about a year of boom before the, the bus took over. Yeah, that was kind of disappointing when the bust happened. Yeah, I went to work for Hughes Tool, this plant uh -huh. here. Uh, we had 5,000 people. By the, time, uh, by the time I quit, uh, we're down to 800. 
Okay, okay. That's kind of typical around here. So the reason we, uh, we wanted to do this podcast with you today was we're kind of celebrating our latest patent. So we got a fourth one, right? You got a, a fourth one here on your, it looks to me like it was a real departure for you from your normal welding activities and get into robotics for uh, surg surgical purposes. Right, That's, yeah, but in, in, in the medical arena, I think intellectual property rights are absolutely critical. So that's why we came to you with this one. But we're, so we're going to do orthopedic surgery, but in order to register the knee, we had to have a, a tactile sensing technique, and, and that's what you, you got us the IP on. Sure, it, it, was, it was very interesting. It went through the process and uh, I haven't seen this before in my career where the examiner initially rejected the application based upon uh, a, a patent that was 415 pages long. And that translates into about 2,000 typewritten pages. And then it took a little work to sort through what the examiner was looking at, but then I found out there's nothing like tactile registration or creating an image of the contour of the knee joint physically with the robot. So we were able to convince the examiner that that was the key to the patent, key to the invention. And so that went through there. Isn't that always the case? I mean, every time we get a rejection, because you know we, we've got four patents now, but I think we probably filed twice that many and we'll, we'll get rejections, and the rejections sometimes are just ludicrous. Yes. It, they have nothing to do with the patent. I'm, I'm always incensed, uh, but I, I guess that's just the way the system works. Uh, yeah, uh, I never get incensed about that because largely getting a patent is a matter of negotiation between the patent office and the inventor, or between the patent office and the attorney for the inventor, and oftentimes just part of that give and take is to, uh, the examiner will recite something that's absolutely ludicrous. We come back and, ah, that's silly, but we'll compromise. We'll give up some of the broad protection that we were initially looking for in order to get a more limited patent, and in order to avoid this reference and they may come back again with something else equally ludicrous, but it's just a, it's a give and take, and oftentimes it works out for people. Most of the time it does, and then we're dealing with human beings in the process where one person's opinion is different than another person's opinion. One person cares about their job, and another person doesn't care about their job. So we've got a large mixture of personalities, ambitions, um, all attitudes and things like that that we're always dealing with in this profession. I guess this is the lesson for our audience today. Any, any budding inventors out there, you know, uh, our inventions are like our children. So uh, it's, it's to us, you know, they're very dear to us. So I, I suppose that is why I, get, I become incensed when we're not granted the entire patent. So a word of warning to all you guys out there, if you file a patent, be, be prepared to have it rejected. It's almost inevitable. I, I think the numbers are going about 85% initial rejections. Uh, and you, know, you got to stay with it. You got to stay with it. Is all I can say. If it's meaningful to you, it takes so long to get it examined—a year and a half, two years—that most people, at the time it's examined, have realized this is going to be successful. This isn't going to be successful. I want to spend more money on it. I don't want to spend more money on it. So it's a decision point at that point in time. But uh, yeah. Too many people regard it as their baby, right? And I uh, try and encourage people: it's not your baby; it's a thing, and it's a challenge. But uh, don't risk your life savings pursuing this. You know, my very first patent that was granted. I was working for Hughes Tool. I came up with a new welding torch, which worked pretty well. Uh, we filed the patent. It was a lot of fun. Enjoy, thoroughly enjoyed the process. You know, didn't have to pay for it back then because I was working for other people. And, uh, but before the patent was granted, I came up with a better idea that was so simple 
that it wasn't patentable, but it was better than my patentable idea. So I called the, uh, the attorneys at Hughes and said, make, you know, I said, hey, good news, we don't need that patent. They said, you don't understand. Patents are part of the value of the company and they continued to pursue it. And my, uh, I still have that patent on the wall up at the Hughes Tool Plant right now. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like IBM for years, it just they don't really care what the patent covers or anything. They just use it as a, a playing card or just to announce, look, we have 10,000 patents this year. And, you know, and the emphasis isn't on protecting anything in particular, the emphasis is on get us another number. Right, trophy on the wall. Trophy on the wall. That's why I tell people a patent is a trophy on a wall, a license to do business, mm -hmm. because if I have a patent on something, then I can build that machine. And that, that's more valuable than, than you might think. Well, I have to correct you there, uh -oh. Dan. I'm wrong. Uh, <laughs> just having a patent doesn't allow you to pursue your invention. It's, uh, there, may, there are dominant patents, there are subordinate patents, and sometimes you have to answer to the person with the more dominant patent that owns the rights to the broader concept. Huh. And you may have invented something that's uh, subordinate to the dominant patent out there. Okay, and that's so, never been the case for us. So and, and you're in such a specialized area that I would <clears throat> never expect that to be a problem for you if you're in maybe more of a mature business like the manufacturer of ladders or um, metal buildings and things like that, maybe there exist things like that out there that you have to answer for. Hmm. With, well, in my case, it allow, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one step closer to being able to build a machine without having, you know, we don't have to worry about somebody else filing the same patent at least. Right, and oftentimes, as we've discussed, you file it just as a defensive publication. The law changed about 15 years ago where it went from the first invent system to invent system to a uh, first to file system. So it was frustrating for a lot of people that had these inventions, but then never filed for a patent on it. And someone later on files for that invention. And to a certain extent, they get priority over you because they, they got the patent and you, you may have built it before and have proof that you invented it before, but it, you know, dominance in the market goes to the person that files the patent first. So, How can that be fair? What was the logic? Why, why did they change that? Uh, it got to be too many contests about, I invented it first, no, I invented it first. Where is your proof of your invention? Uh, oh, I've got five guys that are willing to perjure themselves to say <laughs> that I invented it on this day. I didn't write anything down, yeah, but and here's my notebook that I, you know, with that fresh I poured ink. <laughs> to have a date on it that was before the okay. other guy's date. It was unclear as to how, uh, who had rights in in those circumstances. So it's imperfect, but it actually makes sense because there's no date who fi no doubt who filed first. Right, and and you can always file what's called a provisional application. It's a it's cheap, easy, and it documents at least a date that you filed it. It gives you a filing date, it gives you patent pending, and it avoids those circumstances of someone filing uh, before you did. That accomplishes 80% of what I'm trying to do. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. It's been something in my career that uh, they introduced provisional applications about 15 years ago, and as I've gone along, it becomes, I, I recommend those almost more than I recommend a regular utility patent application. It gives you 90% of what you need to get going. It gives you a year of patent pending status. And at the end of the year, most people can realize I'm going to make money off of this or I've lost interest in it. And they haven't spent an incredible amount of money to try to get the patent on something that's not ever going to enter the market. Hmm. I thought we'd go through the, the three patents that I've done, uh, that you and I've worked on, just, just as kind of case studies. So uh, the first one was a way to clad the inside of pipe with a flat electrode, and it was quite clever. It worked very well, and haven't sold a single one of them. 
But what I have done is it inspired us to do additional research in the field and we came up with another way to do it which is similar but different and not quite patentable and we built dozens of these machines. So, you know, I have no regrets on this, but uh, that patent itself, I can't, I can't point to a single dollar I've made with it. Well, pretty typical, pretty <laughs> typical is that I learned a lot along the way and I made money off of something related to what I did before and got patented. Well, I have no regrets because we, we invented what we call the tripulse machine, and it's it is the way that pipe is clad in the world today. And and I'm pretty much sure that we wouldn't have gotten to that point without having started uh, with this approach. But the difference between the tripulse and and the patent that you that you got for us was the the tripulse is clever, but nothing specifically novel enough to patent. I don't think. Sure. I think we talked about it in right. those days. And you, I think you discouraged yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, but, it's great. So that, there's, a, there's a patent that has tremendous value, but it's never been used. Uh, and then the, the next one we did I thought was great. It was for narrow gap submerged arc welding. That's kind of esoteric, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of nuclear industry. <laughs> okay, and I, I believe that nuclear energy is green. I think it's low carbon. I think it is the ultimate solution, and people will go that way. So, way back when uh, when we invented this thing, uh, in order to build a nuclear uh, power plant, you need to weld very thick pieces of material, like three, five inches thick. And to do that, it's much more efficient to use a narrow gap, and that was the point of this patent. I was so pleased with ourselves. You know, you got the patent for us. And then Fukushima occurred. Oh my! Okay. So, okay. So we had a little uh, uh, had a little problem at a power plant in Japan, and the, the tsunami washed it away, and the whole nuclear industry kind of got a black eye right at that point. I don't think there's been a nuclear plant built since then. Well, none of them using our patent, I guess. <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> I guarantee. So, but you know, I, one day, one day, this is going to be big. So. <laughs> So that, that's the second one, uh, but then, but then uh, I'm leaving the best for last. This one was too much fun. This is a sand screen machine, and when I started Arc Specialties, they, uh, my wife said if I didn't uh, make money, I'd go get a real job. So it's a real motivator. So I used to go all over Houston and work on other people's sand screen machines. I always thought I had a better way, and finally we had an opportunity to build one. You helped me with the patent, and this has been a huge hit, John. Well, that was great to hear. Yeah, we, we've got these running in Russia, China, India, Cyprus, not Texas, the island, and, uh, and all over the world. And, uh, and I think our machines cost two or three times as much as some of our competitors, and yet we're building four of them right now. And I, I, and I think part of the reason people are buying ours, even at a premium, is because of the intellectual property. So thank you very much, John. Oh, very good, very good. I I prepared this, I guess, back in 2004. Right. I don't remember much about it. I prepare these things, and it immediately leaves my brain. Hey, it's real big to me, okay? <laughs> but you know, it, it seemed pretty cool at the time, and I just didn't know whether you'd have any success about it. A success about it, but uh, and oftentimes I never hear about clients having success with their products. They get their patent, and they never talk to me again. No. So, I'm going to bring you a sample. I mean, now that we've, uh, we've we've seen your trophy case with all the interesting projects in there, I'm going to bring you a piece of, of oil well sand screen made on the machine that you patented back in 07. Right, right. right. <laughs> now we're still building these machines. Uh, we just ran one off for China this week. Uh, no, Canada this week, and we're building uh, three more. So that this has turned into a great product for us. I guess the point of my conversation, if there's any budding inventors out there, uh, you got to keep trying. Sure, sure. I mean, you have to start with a certain amount of skill and ability and knowledge in order to be successful, which you obviously have. Remember when we first got together, you were the welding guru in town, and welding was always a hobby of mine. And, and so uh, I see you eventually moved into something very creative with the welding processes. Well, it's, it's been a lot of fun for me. We get, we're up to 65 people now, having too much fun. But, but IP is part of the process, uh, and so you, you've got to file. So, so in a few years, I'll give you a full report on the, the medical one. Uh, I've, sure. got, I've got a very good feeling about this one, too. So I, I think that that's going to 
we're going to do great things with this tactile probe patent that you've got us. It seems like there's a lot of work being done right now in robotics and surgery, and people are very excited about it right now. I need to kind of rewind a bit here, and one of the reasons I like working with you is you're an engineer first, like I said, you know, recovering engineer, a turned patent attorney, so I don't have to explain the words to you. So is that something you should look for in a patent attorney or not? <laughs> We're all more or less engineers. But you should be. We should be, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, your team some, is all some engineers. Some are biological people, some okay. are computer people, and uh, you know, uh, this is sort of my ballywick in these types of things, but if you came to me and said, oh, I've got this uh, organic chemistry type of invention, and eh, I don't know anything about that. I'm no help to you whatsoever. Or here's some complex electronics. Uh, I nearly flunked my double E class in college, so I'm not of a whole lot of help in that direction. But uh, That's so, why you didn't do the, mat uh, the medical one for me. One of your guys did this one. and. You know, somebody with a little more expertise in the medical industry. Oh, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of expertise in the medical field, okay. but it's a... Uh... Well, that one went, went through rather quickly, so that, that was great. So, hey, I've got a question about the online patent searches. Okay. I like them. Uh, IBM has one. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite one? Google Patents. Google Patents, okay. Yep, yep. Fabulous. Fabulous. Okay, one of my good friends, he's gone now, a uh, brilliant guy, multiple patents, a little bit paranoid, is convinced that those search services steal your ideas. Any comments, sir? Yeah, I was talking to Kevin McDaniel in my office about that, and we're just scratching our head going, huh? Uh, I mean, don't file for a patent if you're concerned about someone seeing it sometime or another. And but, but let's say you, you know, young budding inventor comes up with some idea, wants to find out if somebody's already invented the weed eater, uh, mm -hmm. goes online, and, uh, and if he finds that he, somebody's invented the weed eater, he doesn't have to waste his money on a, on a, a futile patent. But then uh, if, he, if he feels good about it, then he proceeds. But at that point, he's vulnerable, right? So that, my friend is yeah. paranoid, right? You know, we yeah, don't, right, okay, right, we don't right. have to worry about this. I wouldn't, I mean, there's so much wrong in that thinking. Um, first is, I don't think there really is anyone out there that's going through these millions of patents going, I'm going to find the one I can steal. Good. Two, if you stole, if, theoretically, if you stole it, well, you're just, you know, the patent covers what it covers. You're just opening yourself up to some liability along the way. And three, in my 40-year career, I haven't had anyone come to see me ever that said, I just found this patent online, or mm -hmm. I went to the patent office and I found this. I want to steal it. What can I do? Well, that was my long-winded version of should you go use the search engines? And, I, and absolutely yes is the absolutely. answer. Absolutely. Okay. That's what I tell people that give me a call on the phone saying they think they have an invention. And I said, before you come to see me, go to Google Patents. It's easy, it's comprehensive, I use it. And if you see what you're doing on, that, uh, on Google Patents, then you don't need to talk to me ever again. Right, save a lot of money. And, and then at least, if you go there and you see things that are close, we'll be in a better position to discuss, like, where we go. And so it, in the old days, it used to be you had to hire someone in Washington to go through the files at the patent office in order to do a search. Uh, a very, very expensive process that was extremely unreliable. So if you came to me and said, I need an opinion about whether this is patentable or not, you get an opinion based on the search, but it also says, don't trust anything I have to say because this could be all wrong and I'm just relying on what's being given to me. Uh, now, people with some expertise can go online and hone in on exactly what's been done before. And yeah, I'm just quoting you. You told me to, to do this. And, and, and one thing you told me early on is I know all the words. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let me start with the searches. And, and, that, and sure. that has served me well. 
Sure. And so, so you're, you're still going with that advice? Yes. I mean, it, it applies almost across the board. If you're really into technology, you know the right words to plug in there. If you're some goober with an idea, well, you know, it still serves your purposes. You know, I, I invented a fishbowl. Okay, I think fishbowl. And they'll see there's 500 patents on fishbowls. And then they can go look through the pretty pictures and see if they've got something or not. So very valuable, very valuable service. To be candid, John, I, I, I avoid talking to you when I can because uh, you charge for your time. And so I still believe that a trade secret has huge merit. And so I think if I, if I can make something, and so particularly our software, we just keep that as a secret. So what, what, when do you file a patent? When, when do you keep it a trade secret? Is there any good rule of thumb? Uh, yeah, I generally agree with you. Maybe I don't agree with you to a certain extent. Certainly on software, that takes a lot of work to replicate. So yeah, you always will keep that secret. Uh, no reason to disclose your software even in a patent application. Um, if you've got a product that's entering the market and people can look at it and figure it out from there, uh, then, you know, okay, how much can you keep secret on a product that's already on the market? If you can trust employees to keep their mouths shut about these secrets, then you don't need to go for a patent. If you can trust the families of your employees to keep these things <laughs> secret, then yeah, you don't need to go for a patent. Other other things are like certain chemical formulas that, well, if I put it into a patent, everyone would know. You're publishing your technology, which was yeah. the point of the patent system in the beginning, sure, right? Sure, sure. Mr. Franklin said it up. Sure, didn't and it's done by drug companies with new pharmaceutical products. They have to put the whole thing in the patent. And then when the patent runs out, the information in there allows the other companies to duplicate what's in the patent and produce the generic product. So uh, that's an example of where it really serves its purpose. You get the monopoly for a little while, and then now you've taught everybody else how to do it. If you can keep it as a secret, there's no time frame. It's your secret for as long, long as you can keep it. Keep Indeed. Well, you know, I guess the line for me is I, uh, I call you when I could examine a machine and in 10 minutes figure out the, the secret sauce. Sure. Or if I could describe it in two paragraphs. And, right. and if either one of those are true, that, that's when your phone rings. Because I, I figure that would be too easy to copy. Right. Right. And for you in a very specialty business like this, uh, there's just not a lot of companies out there that are you know, directly competitive with you. So you've got fewer companies that buy one of your products, uh, take it apart, and try to replicate it one way or another. Now, for many people, you would never be satisfied with just one patent on a product that's making you 50 million a year. You'd establish like a wall of protection with many patents. And it's, a, it's just a, an approach people take. Well, if I got 15 patents on the product, one aspect of it, another aspect of it, it's going to take my competitor a really long time and be very expensive for them to try to figure out how to design around it in order to make a competitive product. And it's a, especially important for very successful products that are fairly easy, easy to replicate. Hmm. Let's talk about geography because you know every time every time we get a patent granted, you ask me if I want to take it overseas, and my answer is always no, uh, because there's a, a U.S. patent is only good for the U.S. Right? Okay, you raise an interesting point. I would say, you know, ten years ago I'd say yeah, 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 well, yeah, clearly, clearly. Mm -hmm. But somehow, somewhere, there is this case involving Western Gecko. And they, they got extra territorial protection on their patent. Wow, did I get that too? Uh, I mean, uh, for the life of me, 
I don't think I agree with what happened, but the Supreme Court came out and said, well, if you offer to sell it into a foreign country, or if you're an infringer and you offer to sell it into a foreign country, you infringe. If you're a foreign company and you offer to sell it in the United States, you're infringing. And if you're a foreign company with a US office and the foreign company offers to sell it to another foreign country, then somehow your US patent protects you against that. It, there's a lot of extra territoriality going on right now with patents. I don't think it's really sorted out. I don't think the law is very good right now. But it, there's absolutely no constraint against a company, another someone in another country does, uh, copying the patent and selling it within their country. Right, right. So, so in, that, in that regard, you, sh you should go for international patents if you want full coverage. Yeah, you got to consider, like, is it worthwhile? It's a cost-benefit analysis every time. Does this country really have a patent system? And Will it do any good? <laughs> will you, are, are you going to enforce it anywhere? Will it do you any good at all? Uh, you know, all of these need to be addressed before you uh, put a bunch of money into foreign patents. And I counsel little guys against doing that. Big guys, yeah, spend your money however you want to. <laughs> What's well, uh, give me a good patent story? Here's a, you know, you've had a, you said, how many years doing this now? Forty years. Forty years doing this. Well, you have a, a good patent story you'd like to tell? Oh, let me see. The good patent stories. And uh, a bad one. You oh, give yeah, me, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. The good and the bad. One of the hilarious ones is the curved shower rod. You see it in every. I'm, I own them. Okay, yeah. you own one. Yeah, and as the world it, gets fatter, we need them, right? You see, <laughs> yeah, you see them in every hotel room across the country. And it was just a fellow in town. His name was Sean Moore. He, he, uh, he was a lawyer, dissatisfied with being a lawyer. He comes to see me and he invented a curved shower rod. I, this isn't patentable. I mean, some hillbilly in Arkansas probably bent a shower rod into a curve so it would fit his the back of his truck or something like that. And then, but that guy persevered, persevered, and eventually, through just sheer effort, was able to sell this across the country. He eventually wound up selling his company for, I believe, around $13 million. And it was, I think the anecdote about it all is the company that bought his company decided we can make a fortune by selling it to the residential market, because he never touched the residential market. And then they realized that this curved shower rod is basically what an ellipse within an ellipse. And it'll only work for standardized tub sizes or shower sizes. Oh, whether a straight rod can uh, is telescopic. Right. It'll but fit you, anything. You, you can't telescope an ellipse in an ellipse. So. Uh, when people were buying this, they go, well, it doesn't fit my, my shower. Darn and it. I know, I know. And so the people that bought it, I don't think had much success with it at all. So that's, that's your good and bad story. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It worked out well for my client and all of that. You had others where there was a gasoline additive by a fairly big chemical company. And I swear they spent millions to get patents all around the world on this little additive that would improve gas mileage, maybe a you know, quarter of a mile per gallon. And the, you know, all the experiments show it, it worked. And by the time we got patents all around the world, I get the email from them saying, it doesn't work. Ouch. Uh, stop all work, it doesn't work. And, you know, ooh, ooh. And Hopefully they could afford this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was a sizable company. They could afford it, but on the other hand, it's like, wow, how much effort and money went into that to find out it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then uh, right now, one of my successful inventors, you may have seen it if you ever go into a Bucky's or a, an academy, he makes a crawfish cleaner. It's just a big bucket with some handles on it and a special spray nozzle that cleans crawfish. And the whole world wants crawfish now, just from 
being a guy that came in with an idea, it became this huge business for him. Good for him. And good, good things to see. Those are my favorite. The, mm -hmm. the guy that, and of course, sometimes the guy that comes to see me with a little idea and they become so successful, then, then it's time to part ways with them. Like, you're too big for me to handle. <laughs> Let me refer you to someone bigger than that can handle everything. And so then like 25 years of relationships kind of disappear on you because these people got too successful. Now the money guys come in, now the uh, underwriters are there, now they have, to, they have to get more done than what is reasonable for me to do. Hmm. I'm glad we haven't outgrown you yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're perfect for me. All right. Uh, so the, the budding inventor listening to this, do you have any uh, words of wisdom for uh, these guys? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Google patents first. Google patents first. Just mantra. Google patents first. How about should you build your idea? I don't know. What? I don't know. I think uh, you should just to see if it'll work. Yeah, you know, I haven't been big on that one way or another. Um, you're probably thinking at a more advanced level than the guys, the, the individual inventors that I might see. I'm just saying it would prevent perpetual motion machines from showing up at your doorstep. Right, Because right. it ain't going to work. It's not going to work, although <laughs> that's the key with in perpetual motion machines. Everyone thinks that they've invented it, but if they just got the machining better, like a bicycle wheel, and it spins freely. Okay, so they don't need to build their invention. Yeah, yeah. They go search it. Search it, search it, search it, and then never talk to an invention marketing company because <laughs> they'll fill your head with all these bad ideas. And those ideas will never leave your brain. And uh, then maybe talk to me before you even talk to your friends and relatives because what I've found is friends and relatives say, that's a fantastic idea. You need to get that patented. You're going to make millions on that. And then they're just being nice to the person. As soon as the person leaves, they'll go, oh, he's crazy. So uh, I'll steer people in the right direction. Uh, and, uh, and it's not like one size fits all. There's a million different approaches people can take on these things depending on the person, the money behind the people, um, what they want to accomplish, and all of that. You know, simple things for the budding inventor. I got one question for you. Uh, one of my friends, brilliant, brilliant engineer, has a patent, didn't build it himself. You know, everything that you and I work on, I go build it and yeah. I sell it. So that, that's how the money flows, right? But he, uh, very clever invention used on solenoid valves, he is literally the only inventor I know that licensed his patent and made significant sums of money. Really? There's more of them out there? Really? I, I don't know. I haven't heard of very many. Okay, people. all right. That's, that, that was my point is, uh, you know, I want these patents so we can go build stuff and, and, you know, keep my people employed. But this one guy... He, every solenoid valve has his patented metallurgical tube in it, but that's pretty rare, is my point, right? Oh, I mean, you see on television, license your invention to industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I may have seen one or two in my whole career. Okay, we're, we're tied, one, one. You yeah, know? exactly, okay. exactly. So people should not assume that they can take their ideas, run over to the, the Acme company, and, and then become rich. Yeah, I mean, you're just not going to see it. Here's this piece of paper I have. It's a patent. Now pay me a million dollars. Okay. So it doesn't happen. So you need to do it like I'm doing it then. Sure, sure, sure. Patent your idea, build your idea, sell your idea. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You need. You know, no one's going to buy a piece of paper from you. Yeah. They've got to see it work. They've got to get more. They've got to see a marketplace for it. They've got to, people. Larger companies buy smaller companies uh, based upon the success of the smaller company. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to demonstrate some sort of success with the product in order to have any interest in people buying your patent rights mm -hmm. and your company. And so so be, get prepared to build a company. 
Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, if you already yeah. got a company, you use a patent to build your company, but if you get a patent, you got to build a company. Okay. Right. Good. Right. I'm glad you agree with me on that because so many people come to me and say, hey, I got this great idea. Mm -hmm. I go, well, great. What are you going to do with it? Okay. Right. Right. And then most people don't have a sense of how much it costs to actually build a product. Right. So... And then rebuild it. And then rebuild it. And then finally, finally refine it to a point where it's saleable. Right. Right. Okay. It's an extreme endeavor. All right. What are, what are your uh, parting comments for us today? Got any, anything I missed on, or did we cover everything? I think we covered everything, Dan. It's always a pleasure to see you. We've had such a long relationship doing this, this stuff. Uh, and I'm always glad to appear on uh, your podcast here. So if you want to have me back at any time, I'd be happy to do it again. Well, it's, it's been a huge benefit for me all these years because you, uh, you, you politely turn me away from stupid ideas and, uh, and you patent the good ones. So uh, that, that's worked out well. And, and I just wanted to share that with people because people ask me, you know, how, do you, how, how did you succeed? And what it is, is I learned from others and, and, and I've definitely benefited from this relationship. So thank you so much for coming on the Roboticist Chronicles today. Uh, go ahead and pitch your company. How do, how do they find you? Are you on the internet? <laughs> oh yeah, if you looked up uh, you know, like Egbert McDaniel and Swartz or John Egbert uh, on a search, I think I'm the only Egbert around in the world of patents. So yeah, I'm there. Give me a call. I don't charge anything for chatting with people. Oh, you shouldn't phone. have said that. <laughs> I know. I, I love to talk to people about this stuff. So, uh, and then, you know, yeah, we're just busy as can be these days. So that's excellent. Is it all oil field or, or what's going on? No, I don't know how after 40 years my career would turn out this way, <laughs> but about. 60% 60, 60 of our work comes from Turkey. Explain that one. You meet someone in Turkey, a law firm in Turkey, a and they like you. in Turkey, that guy likes the work you're doing, he goes and convinces the other people in the firm to use you, they quit, form their own firms, join someone else, and so forth and so on. And I think we do about 90% of the intellectual property work that comes out of Turkey. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> odd, odd. I, you, know, you look at like how you wanted your career to progress from the beginning toward the end, and go. No, I would have never guessed that 60% Turkey would be how it would turn out. Oh, but, I, I, I've got the same story. You know, you never really know. But what I tell people is, you capitalize on opportunity. That's right. And you never know which way you're going to go. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast for, with us. Uh, we'll see if we can do this again in the near future. Okay, fantastic, Dan. Uh, too much fun. Bye. Find all these. I, I, I knew a archivist at the library who, when he got a new interesting photo that came in, he would give me a call and say, you want to take a look at this? Now, here is the building of the first light rail in downtown Houston. On Main. Yeah, up on Main Street. And you can see how nasty that must have been. They, they built a little walkway so people could walk across <laughs> the street without getting too uh, messed up. And here's, one, here's a classic photograph. If you ever heard about Houston being a real estate scam, <laughs> this shows what they sent over to England to try to entice people to, to come in to, uh, to Houston. Those hills are going Look at all the mountains <laughs> yeah. there. Look at that beautiful stream. And the, and the uh, stone bridge. I don't uh, see many of those. Uh, it, it, it was in a few other drawings of Houston back in those days. It must have been there <laughs> because it's an odd thing to create, but, but uh, I don't know what it turned into or what happened to it. Was it literally the capital at that point? Or is that yeah, the, yeah. Okay. Yes. So that, that part's true. The capital was where the Rice Hotel is. And then here is the oldest known photograph of Houston back in 1856 before the Civil War. And that burned down shortly after this photo was taken. The whole town was lit on fire. Yeah. Here, 
is probably one of the most historic moments in the history of the city, the unveiling of the Astrodome. And you've got city council sitting there. And why they didn't remove this box that holds the velvet rope. It's a sanitary <laughs> napkin box. Sitting right out in front of everybody. <laughs> 62. And this jaunty fellow right here gained fame later on in life as being the guy that married Anna Nicole Smith. I remember that. Howard Marshall. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't reckon anybody recognize anyone else. So. Yeah, you know, there are guys like Squatty Lyons and I know this guy here, the Monsignor, lived about 104 years old, so he was the last living person out of that group. Ah. In the Astrodome. This is the Rice Hotel before they built the third tower. Traffic jam in downtown Houston. And uh, the most interesting sign, I've never figured it out Chase and Sanborn Coffee dating prevents rancid taste. Like, who advertises the word rancid taste in association <laughs> with their coffee? Uh, this was my old building here. Right. I have offices up at the top. One of my favorite there. Collection of celebratory events. There's Howard Hughes on the ticker tape parade through downtown Houston. Another curious sign, Alaskan furs. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you need Alaskan furs here? That's why we had to have air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> here is the end of World War I, the victory sang out by the Rice Hotel. <laughs> Nowadays the war's never end. We can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> there is the Aggie Band marching through downtown Houston back in 1909 oh, at City right. Hall. Oh. Beautiful building, they knocked it down. Oh. Here is World War II, where the city raised enough money to build the battleship USS uh, Houston. And all these people are enlisting into the war effort. Do you know the history of that boat, that ship? I don't, I don't. Oh, yeah. I wish I, I had to look that up. And then, um, I don't think I have anything interesting here. Here, this is a curious one here, Main Street, uh, once again, another traffic jam with Model T's. Um, everyone wears their hat, except this one fellow right here walking along without a hat on. And what's interesting is when they built the light rail outside, they came upon a concrete structure in the middle of the road they couldn't identify when they ripped up Main Street. And they go, it's an octagonal structure. What could this possibly be? What was the base of the traffic control? Oh. That tower one. where there's a guy there's a human up, in there guy up there would hold a red uh, sign or a green sign here is panoramic view of downtown that was very complicated to get and more complicated to frame from around the 1930, 1930. The, the Astro Astrodome World. with Astroworld. Oh. Astroworld was just being built when this photo was being taken. And you'll see the Astrodome and the old Colt Stadium in the background there. I've never heard of the Colt Stadium. Yeah, Colt 45s. Huh. I've heard of that. Oh, so they yeah. had their own stadium. They had their own horrible stadium horrible stadium, no shade whatsoever. They had a double header one day in 95 degree weather and about 100 people had heat stroke during the game. <laughs> and they, when they were done with it, they took it down and shipped it down to Monterey, Mexico and it became the Monterey, Mexico uh, baseball stadium. Uh, they didn't have the big roller coaster. No, no, not at all, not at all. <laughs> A very interesting That's tour of the history. We 
I liked it when you had your balcony. We could walk all the way around. Oh, and, and, and that see was wonderful. Yeah, I missed that. Okay, uh, this is my hall of inventions, and it's all pretty interesting. Here is a client of mine makes these chin guards that are worn by, I think, over half of the NFL players oh. these days. Just a little niche market mm -hmm. where uh, everyone likes it. Half the college players are wearing this chin guard. It's and he has intellectual property right protection? Yep, yep. Uh, then you had... I've seen that. The screw pull, yeah. It was a very successful invention by an old oil guy in town, Herb Allen, who started Cameron Ironworks. And a client of mine. Yeah. Oh, really? Cameron, Cameron Iron is. Oh, yeah. This is a wire stripper tool, outstanding tool. <sighs> It should have been a great invention, absolutely great invention because it just strips the coating off the end of the wires. But Kmart bought it, displayed it, no one knew what it was, no one bought it. It all wound up in the dollar bin at uh -huh. the, the stores. Um, successful inventions. Uh, here's a cow with a string coming out of its butt. <laughs> Uh, that's patentable. When, when it worked, yeah, when it worked, it cow vibrated when you pulled the string, but I guess we pulled the string so much it doesn't vibrate anymore. Here you have a koozie, which is a fine idea, but... Oh, it, uh, hook them horns. Yeah, except if you drink out of it... <laughs> it pokes your eyes. It pokes your eyes out. <laughs> Other than that, it was an excellent idea. Here you have a... Uh, roller hockey puck and it was significant because the guys that invented it just came up with some stray plastic from somewhere and molded it except it was lemon scented plastic so it gained a lot of uh, recognition throughout the roller hockey community as the lemon scented hockey puck. Uh, let's see. Here you have a zipper puller. Oh. And if you can't quite get the zipper up or down, you can use that. Here, this was called Wacky Googles. Now, people actually spent money to get these patented. And this is one where if you put it in front of your eyes, it turns your eyes upside down. Well, that is handy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't realize you had this uh, trophy case. If I didn't know this, I'm, I'm going to bring you some welds from the yeah. patents we I like this one here. Tissue holder and cutter. In case you're just not strong enough to pull those perforations <laughs> off of your toilet paper, <laughs> you can use this to assist you. <laughs> then you have the pet scoop. And it's only funny when you read the back of it and you just shovel pets left off from toilet pan. Your lovely pet usually enjoy clean environment. <laughs> if you are tired of clean dirty cat litter she will do something else. Resist using toilet pan and get cystitis. <laughs> Who handled the translation on that one? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It's like you send your product off to China, and that's what you get back. That one, Johnny. Oh, get this one here. All right, oh, we got a better. This one. is a better one. Yeah, where I got my master's degree, and it was awarded in the state of Indinia. <laughs> Indinia. They misspelled Indiana. <laughs> <laughs>